Today we're looking at uh, Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, and we're going to look at uh, the conversation that uh, Habakkuk, as he was dialoguing with God. And in Habakkuk chapter 1, it says the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or, or cry out to you violence. But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife, conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that, the, so that justice is perverted. Then the Lord's answer, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if you were told. I am rising up, raising up the Babylonians, that, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places, not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. They are cavalry, gallops headlong, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a, a vulture swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deridge, derid kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities, they build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own strength is their God. Wow, what a dialogue. The, the prophet here obviously was uh, perplexed. Uh, wickedness and, and, and violence seemed uh, to go unchecked. Uh, would there be no end? Uh, and would we, could we just rid this sin, is what he's saying. Uh, Habakkuk took his complaint to God. Why don't you do something? Uh, and God answered, I am doing something. Judah will be punished by Babylon. And then the prophet was more perplexed. <laughs> Habakkuk's distress happened to be a profound dilemma, so he continued his conversation with God. And he says, uh, why? Would you use those wretched Babylonian variants to judge Judah? Why would you do this to us? So Habakkuk was in distress in verses 1 through 4. And in verses 1 and 2, uh, he, the question that arises from the passage of Scripture is, why is God indifferent to supplication? See, it's a little wonder that the book was titled The Oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. The prophet called his writing a massa, a burden. He was writing it, and he, and he called it a burden. And this Hebrew noun is derived from a verb meaning to lift up, and consequently signifies what is lifted up, and thus a burden is lifted up to God. The message Habakkuk uh, presented is indeed a weighty one. However, Massa was not always used uh, to uh, preface a, a burdensome message. It was used, for example, as a title for the rather non-threatening sayings in, if you've read Proverbs 30 and even verse, or chapter 31. Nonetheless, there was a very heavy message that Habakkuk had. Uh, the title here might be literally translated the burden that uh, Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. Um, the same two uh, Hebrew words, burden and saw, they're used in Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 1 uh, from Isaiah the prophet. The word saw, when used uh, by the prophet, you know, often means to see a vision. 
prophecy a vision, receiving glimpses from God and what he's going to do uh, in the future. So receiving a vision of what God is going to do in the future. The prophets were sometimes called God seers, looking and seeing what God is doing. So in chapter 1 and verse 2, the prophet's long-standing concern, which finally erupted into a, a, a volcanic uh, explosion, <laughs> is twofold. First, he wanted to know why God seemed so indifferent. Why doesn't God hear? Second, he wanted to know why God seemed so insensitive. Why doesn't God help? Why doesn't he come to our aid? Habakkuk's word, how long, show his agony over God's seemingly delay in responding to the prophet's concerns. Now we come to the point of thinking about this passage of scripture that many Christians today sense the same problem. They wonder why God seems silent when they pray. As a matter of fact, why does God seem silent when so many people are praying? Like several of the Psalms, Habakkuk went to God to complain about his troubles and his troubles about his people. He described the injustice that was uh, rampant all around him and then asked, how long? Why? And later he used the same words again, why? How long? The prophet sounded more like a singer than a seer. Part of Israel's worship involved making a passion to please to God uh, for help in uh, desperate, des desperate times of trouble. And this was one of the times Israel did not normally complain about its troubles. Uh, you know, in a, in a letter to the editor, you might say, they took their pleas directly to God in worship because they knew he'd hear an answer prayer. Uh, Habakkuk's concern uh, was not only that, that his cries went unheeded, but the, but the corruption continued to go unchecked and God wasn't doing anything about it. He cried uh, to God, violence, but, but you seem to do nothing. Uh, the stark word violence sums up the chaos that Habakkuk witnessed around him. It was a chaotic time. The world, uh, the, this, this word is sprinkled throughout the book like ink blots on a, on a crumpled page in history. So the question in verses uh, three and four from Habakkuk, uh, why is God sensitive to sin? Why is he uh, sen uh, insensitive, insensitive to suffering? Sin was abounding and God seemed both indifferent and he seemed idle like he wasn't doing anything. Habakkuk put the blame on God uh, with his penetrating questions. Why do you make me look at the injustice that's going on around me? Then he asked an even greater question. Why do you tolerate wrong? The picture was bleak. Destruction and violence were coupled with strife and conflict. All kinds of different things were going on. In verse 4, the, tra the greatest tragedy, however, was that the people neglected God's law. Habakkuk described the consequence. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. It becomes numb. It becomes cool. Uh, and then in verses 5 through 11, you can see that God's disclosure is here. And though the prophet was engaged in a typical Jewish lament and he was asking essentially rhetorical questions, God answered his complaint. The Lord was neither indifferent nor he was he insensitive. God, God was not idle. He was already at work specifically behind the scene. Uh, he had plans to discipline an erring Judah. He received those plans to, to, to uh, you know, and when, when Habakkuk received those plans, he became distressed when this was revealed. Why would you send Babylon to straighten out Judah? And then God's intention of discipline is found in verse 5. Look at the nations and watch, was God's reply. Just look carefully and listen. Watch. God addressed both the prophets and the people. 
The Bacchic had complained about being made to look at injustice, but the prophet and the people suffered from Mepodia. They were too nearsighted. They could only concentrate on exactly what was going on. God instructed them to get their eyes <coughs> off the immediate uh, havoc and look out to the international horizons. They needed to develop a different worldview, a worldview that included the nations. And as they did so, they would be utterly amazed at what was going to happen. The political developments about to be revealed to Habakkuk and the people would stun them. The verb means, toma, means to be astounded, bewildered, or dumbfounded when they found out all this information that God was giving them. In fact, Habakkuk was dumbfounded. What God was about to perform would be hard for them to believe, even though God would reveal it to them, and they, and they knew ahead of time. And then you can see in verses 6 through 11, God's instrument of discipline. Judah's sin would not go unchecked. Justice was not dead, nor did it sleep. Discipline was forthcoming. It was on its way. Correction was on its way. But the surprise was not the anticipated discipline, but the dispenser of the discipline. Who would dispense that discipline? It was not coming... Uh, it was not coming correction that was unbelievable, but the channel of the correction that seemed so incredible. The Babylonian, are you serious? Destruction by the Babylonians is found in verse 6. God dropped the bombshell. I'm raising up the Babylonians against Judah. Judah was just a speck of loose dust before the gigantic vacuum cleaner. The description of the Babylonians is found in verses 7 through 11. The Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans, lived in southern Mesopotamia and were called an ancient nation. They were there for a long, long time. They had a great, they had a, they had a quite a history there. Babylonian apparently was without rival, the terrible and dreadful people uh, were a law to themselves. They promoted their own honor lifted them, themselves up. Uh, they recognized no law or judge but themselves. And their superiority and their authority was gained by their own ruthless conquests as they went about doing evil and wicked. And then in verse 8, in a vivid and awesome imaginary, the, the Lord further described the foe as a people with horses swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. There was no stopping the Babylonians. Collectively, they all came bent on violence. The enemy was coming like a whirlwind and would gather the prisoners like sand, a figure of expressing numbers too vast to calculate. In verse 10, they were confident in their strength. The Babylonians scoffed at kings, they ridiculed rulers. They had no respect for others. It was their custom to exhibit captive rulers as public spectacles. Look what, who we've captured. Who, look who we, who we have control over. And then in verse 11, the first part of the verse is a little difficult to translate. Then they swept past like the wind. They consider their own strength as their own God. And then there's Habakkuk's dilemma. He's still a dilemma here. God's amazing disclosure left the prophet even more perplexed, more bewildered. Uh, Habakkuk's complaint about the sin and the lawlessness in Judah was met by God's response that he was not ignorant of his people's conduct. He knew what was going on. Judgment was on the way. The Babylonians would soon take these erring people Captive, And the prophet was just simply astonished, just as God said that he would be. He was appalled that Yahweh would employ so evil an instrument to punish Judah. Habakkuk expresses deep concern. He questions God's plan. Uh, why would you, why would God employ a people of iniquity 
However devastating the divine judgment may sound, the prophet drew a conclusion and hope from God's holiness and God's faithfulness. In verse 12 in Hebrew, the form of the question, O Lord, are you not from everlasting, requires an affirmative reply. It's as much a declaration as an interrogation. The prophet's confidence in the living eternal God, Yahweh, is contrasted starkly with the previous verse in which the Babylonians considered their own strength to be their God. In verse 13, a burning question remained in Habakkuk's heart. Why would the everlastingly preeminent Yahweh, the absolutely holy one, the immutable uh, uh, permanent rock, utilize so wicked a people to administer discipline on Judah. Certainly, his concern over God seemingly silent had, had, had concerned many of God's people. Why would God endorse a people of injustice. Habakkuk said that God made men like fish in the sea, like, like sea creatures. They have no ruler. The wicked Babylonians were pictured catching unsuspecting men like fish with hooks, sweeping them into the net and gathering them into a large, uh, large drag net. And the imagery is vivid. Jeremiah used a similar uh, analogy uh, of fishermen, coupling it with uh, that of hunters. They're hunting their prey. Why would God excuse a people of idolatry? The hook and the nets brought food, plenty for the Babylonians. Their conquest provided not only a livelihood, but also they lived in luxury. So these barbaric people paid homage to the instruments that contribute to their prosperity. Already God had declared that the Babylonians saw their might as they treat the, their power as if it's a god. Now Habakkuk added to their military power brought monetary profit. Idolatry is not limited to those who bring sacrifices or burn incense in, 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 to, to uh, intimate objects. People of position, power, or even prosperity often pay homage to the business or even to the agency that provides them uh, their coveted status. It becomes their constant obsession. It becomes even their God. Verse 17, the prophet asked the fat fisherman, Babylonians, if he was to keep on emptying his net, deploying uh, destroying nations without mercy. Will you continue? The action depicted significance, a seemingly perpetual operation that the Babylonians operated. They emptied their net so they could still fill it again and again and again. When would God stop the Babylonians from their greed and for, from their conquest? How could he let a people continue to be in power, so openly worship that very power as their God. Well, sure, it confused Habakkuk, just like we can be confused today. Then there's a dredge from God. Habakkuk pronounced God's destruction to Babylon. The, pro the, the, uh, the, the prophet's dilemma deepened. Why should God use an ungodly nation such as a Babylonian as the instrument of God's own judgment on his people Judah. Habakkuk had boldly lodged his contentions and now he waited for God's reply. Surely some logical explanation would be given. There are several things that we could learn from Habakkuk. Life can be difficult for all of us at some point. And we have wondered, where is God? Where is God in all of this? We can't lose our joy 
on the circumstances that surround our lives. We can't let the enemy steal that from us. See, when we don't understand God's plan, that's when we have to trust. We have to trust in an everlasting God, one that has promised us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. God has a plan. It may not be exactly the plan that we think that should be developed, but he has a plan. He sees what's going on. He sees the wickedness. He knows exactly what's taking place in our world and on our own private world. He sees what's going on all around us. And he will step in. So when we don't understand God's plan, that's when our faith has to go to work. That's when our trust is tested. May God bless us as we had the opportunity to look at the book of Habakkuk, and we may visit this again here real soon. Uh, we'll just wait and see.